I'm Dutch Van Kirk, and I was a navigator on the first atomic bomb. My first question isn't necessarily about about your your mission, but in general, as far as World War II history and so forth, and your story in particular, why is it important for you that these stories live on? Do you want to fight World War III? No. No, you do not. Nobody wants to fight World War III. And it is important that people know the consequences of war so that we don't stumble into another one. And I'm afraid we're about to. Yeah, there's a looming threat. It is sort of thing. But uh, they, we have enough people working on it. I don't think it, it, it will probably work. But and, and it will probably be in the Middle East too, and this sort of thing. But I don't want to fight World War III. I don't want to fight the Germans again. I don't want to fight anybody else and that sort of thing. And if I don't want to, it's important that people know what war is all about so they don't stumble in. They hear, they hear uh, me talking and they think, boy, he was having a good time during the war. Well, during the war, I was not having a good time. End of story. Yeah, the big reason I'm doing this and, and interviewing you today is so that I can pass your story along to the next generation. Very good. I appreciate um, that. You know, if you've looked, picked up a, a modern history book for modern junior hires and high schools, it barely touches on, on these stories. I'm, I'm well aware of that. And to me, that, that's, that's a tragedy. World War II made this country great, in my opinion. Do you feel the same? In a lot of ways. I mean, we went into uh, it. We were great for a while, but, but I'm afraid we're on the downward slide again now. Yeah, true, true. Um, now, before the Hiroshima mission, what, what, what sort of missions were you flying before that? I was over in England and uh, North Africa, and I was uh, flying. I started out flying out of uh, a place called... Uh, Where, 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 some, some uh, airfield up north of London. And we were flying, just flying ordinary missions. And then I got commissioned to take uh, Eisenhower uh, and group down to uh, North Africa. And we flew a bunch of them around, and then completed our missions down there later, and finally got back to the States. When did you when did you head to the Pacific? Was it right, right before the Hiroshima mission? Were you, were you just selected for that, and that's when you went, or? You, yeah, well, I, we were all back in the states. Tibbets was back in the states, Fairbeer was back in the states, and so was I. And uh, Tibbets got command of the 509th outfit, with authority to select anybody he wanted by name to be in the group. And he selected Tom Ferriby and me. How'd that make you feel to be hand selected by Tibbets? Like my head was on a block. <laughs> no, no, we, we we really didn't. We were confused. We didn't know uh, how we were going to do it. We were convinced we were going to do it, but we didn't know how we were going to do it, or anything else. And. Uh, uh, we didn't know whether we were just being expendable or whether this is going to be part of the end of the war. Um, in, in some of my, my research, uh, did you guys drop the pumpkin bombs in, in preparation for... Oh yes, yeah, a lot of them. And those were all over Japan targets, um, Japanese targets? No, no, them. no. We, 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 we transferred, we uh, bombed the... A few of them are out of Wendover, Utah, also. But when you they, haven't heard the story in, about, drop, about dropping the one on uh, a small town in uh, South, uh, South uh, uh, Georgia, California. Oh, no. No, oh, Tom Ferry dropped the bomb and he had adopted that a, a, uh, a, some flight engineer was along said he was going to improve bombing. I don't know how the hell it improved Tom's bombing, but that's okay. Anyhow, all of a sudden, this, we were on the bomb room. 
all of a sudden the bomb is released. The airplane surges and everything else. Tom Fabry wakes up and says, what the hell happened? He says, I didn't do that. And he hadn't done it. But the other engineer had. The other engineer never came around our base again. We had guys around Carpentier, California with picks and shovels digging out where the, the pumpkin had fallen and everything else to get it before anybody else did and everything else. That's funny. But, but we almost bombed our own target. Um, take us through the morning of, of August 6th, the morning of the, of the bombing mission. Okay. Everything connected with the bomb concerned distance. How far were you going to be away from the bomb so it would not blow up the airplane? The first guy that, I think, guy that we talked to was one of the scientists. And he says, uh, well, we think you guys will be very, will be okay if you're 11 miles away from the bomb when it explodes. I remember looking at the guy and I said, how the hell sure are you? <laughs> and this sort of thing. He says, I'm not sure. He says, some people are saying it has to be 50. Some people are saying it has to be 100. Some people are saying they don't give a damn. I says, you're not one of them, obviously. Well, we started working on getting distance between us the bomb. The best way was altitude. Tibbets, he remembered his days of flying out of Albuquerque up here and flying at high altitude against our fighters. Our fighters could not touch us at high altitude. They could make one pass and that's it. So we decided, number one, we needed altitude, all the altitude we could get. And then the other thing was just run away from the bomb. So we, we were also very heavily loaded, by the way. We had another problem, getting the airplane off the ground. Because we were about 150,000 pounds max gross weight for a B-29 and uh, the normal max gross weight for a takeoff over there, from most takeoffs, was 135,000. And we, didn't, we could not stretch the one right away any further. We, we had run out of land, unfortunately, by that time. So, um, uh, just what we had, we had a problem with weight of the bomb. We had to put the bomb in the front, in the front bomb bay, had to load f fuel in the back bomb bay to get our weight balance right. Uh, then we had to get the plane off the ground. Then we had to fly the plane over to the target. Now, how do you get away from when you, when you drop the bomb, which did this thing? So, Tom Ferby's going in there or dropping, he, talking to it. He's talking while we're taking, he's dropping the bomb, by the way. We, we were all set for this and this sort of thing. So, Tom was uh, there and he says, uh, there's nothing I can do. Just going right down the target. So, uh, when we ran right, right down, we decided to be earlier on. That was the fastest way away from the bomb was a 150 degree turn to the right and just run like hell. And that's exactly what we did. We were about 20 miles away when the bomb exploded. It took 43 seconds from the time the bomb left the airplane until the time it exploded at 1,800 feet above the ground. And during that time, we were 40, 20 miles away. And I don't know what happened to the airplane. There's a hell of a lot of turbulence, I know that, and everything else. So then everything was okay. And Tibbetts went around, he says, everybody report in. You know, that meant everybody was supposed to say how, their, how, how the airplane was. Did, did we still have two wings? Did we still have a tail section? And everything else. Everybody reported in okay, so Paul says, okay, he says, I'll just turn around and take a look at what had happened. So he turned around and flew back toward the target, and uh, 
All we could see when we got back there was the city of Hiroshima covered with dense black smoke and dust from the, I was kicked up by the bomb. So we couldn't see anything, so we decided to go home. That, and a mission. And uh, <clears throat> after the mission and you returned back to the States, were you, were, were you, were you yourself and the rest of the crew, Tibbet's crew, are regarded as heroes on your return? I don't think so. I don't think I was ever regarded as a hero. Well, we didn't return right away. We had to go up to the Japan first. Mm -hmm. uh, we flew up to Japan. We uh, got some of the scientists from the Japanese program. We took them with us down to uh, Hiroshima where we could not land because of no airfield. And then we went down to Hiroshima where we could land. And the commanding officer came out and all he wanted to do was surrender his sword. Have my sword, sir! And that sort of thing. And this sort of thing. So uh, uh, we, everybody debated about who was going to take his sword. Tibbets finally says, told some sergeant to take it. And this sort of thing. We were then driven to vehicles to take us into Nagasaki. 1927, about 1927 Chevrolet models. And they broke, both broke down before we got into Nagasaki. And uh, I have a beautiful picture of Tibbets explaining to a Japanese driver what's wrong with his 1927 Chevrolet. Tibbets doesn't speak Japanese. The driver doesn't speak English. Than anything else. It was the blind leading the blind. <laughs> but we finally made it there. We went into Nagasaki and stayed there two days, then and that's it. And then, then later on I went over the bikini test. I didn't want to, but they says, You are essential, you will go to the bikini test. I says, But I got a thousand points, sir. And the guy says, I don't give a damn how many points you have, you're going to bikini. Did you stay with the, the Enola Gay the whole time, or? Because I, I read that uh, Enola Gay got, got, got um, reassigned to the bikini test as well. Yes, I was with her. I was with the Enola Gay during the bikini test. Sometime thereafter, they were sent to Phoenix to be chopped up. And uh, they rescued it, however, and this down the Smithsonian. Have you, seen, have you seen her since she's been in the Smithsonian? Oh, yeah, many times, many times. Then we sued. <laughs> I've seen the boxcar in, in uh, Dayton, yeah. and that was a pretty neat sight. And they had well, the box, the box car, they let a lot of the people go through it a lot of times. And the people went through it and took what they wanted and everything else. Uh, the Nola could go to Nola Gay, they didn't do that. We, we were, the Nola Gay is better preserved. Um. With the bikini test, what did you? What was your involvement with the bikini test? Or were you? You don't really want to know. <laughs> were you flying missions? I know that Nola Gay didn't didn't drop any of the hey, bombs. Our crew was flying missions. Tom Ferriby was dropping bombs for record. They had a contest going on. You got to drop six bombs for record, and the winner will drop will drop the the uh, bomb of bikini. Tom had an average air of 300 and some odd feet. The inherent air in a Norton bomb site is one mil. That means you're all 300 feet for every 30,000 feet of altitude. He was that good. He was better than that. And then they come in and they says, well, you haven't taken into account the circulation of the earth, the wind dangling, and all that sort of stuff. They screwed him out of it. The bombardier who did drop the bomb at the bikini at a bomb test, Tom Ferriby and Kermit Behan, went over his records, his calculations, before he dropped that bomb. And both of them said, that bomb will drop half a mile to the left and short. That's where the bomb hit. Oh, wow. Exactly. 
and everything else. So we were, we were urged to get out of Bikini as soon as possible, which we did. Flew back to Washington. That was good for me. I got out of the service and went back to college. Nice. So uh, what, what did you do for fun back you know, then? What, did, what, did you follow any sports teams? Uh, fun uh, when? Uh, doing it while I was in the service? Yeah, when you're, in your rec time if you had any, what little you had. No, we played baseball. Oh, nice. We did. We didn't have. We didn't follow the sports teams, nah. But we played baseball. Her, her husband broke a colonel's nose one day. I remember that, <laughs> and everything else. Uh, this was a play at the plate. There was a play at the plate, and Tom Ferriby slid into home, and Butch Blanchard tagged him in the face, then broke his nose. Several days, several weeks later. He got the out, though. What's that? He got the out, though. The what? Huh? He, he got the out? Yeah. <laughs> several days later, the same thing in reverse happens. Butch is on third base, and Tom is catching. Tom gets the ball, and Tom says, God himself would not have released that ball the way I hella held it on to. And he tagged Butch Blanchard right in the face and broke his nose, too, but that's okay. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, we, no, we, we played a lot of baseball and, uh, and did a lot of things like that. Have you, uh, have you had the opportunity to meet any of the survivors of the bombings over Nagasaki, Hiroshima since, you know, since the war? Unfortunately, yes. And um, if you don't mind me asking, how, how, did, how did that go for you? I mean, how did it make well, you they got, I know I was right. When we drop, we and say, we were proper, right, and proper in dropping the bomb in order to end the war and stop the killing. And I didn't think anything they say is not going to change it. Yeah, had we invaded, we'd have lost hundreds oh, yeah. of thousands more lives on both sides. So, well, that's about that. About wraps it up for me. I, I appreciate your time. Thank you. Now, thank you very much. Do you have any, any questions? Sue, do you have what any? What do you What do you do for fun nowadays? I'm 93 years old. He still plays baseball. <laughs> I should. Now, Tom was a baseball player. He was. He was a property of the uh, St. Louis Cardinals uh, as a catcher. He'd, he'd have been catching for the St. Louis Cardinals the next year if he hadn't gone to the Army. Wow. He was that good. Wow. You just see his hands. Every finger was broken. And there's, I was a catcher. Yeah. <laughs> and a guy, a guy out in California one time says, uh, I'd like to make a cast of your hands. And he looked at Tom Fairby's hands and he says, What the hell did you do? Run them through a threshing machine? 